Right, good morning. This is the Pitt County Board of Commissioners Budget Workshops. This is um, Wednesday, June the 3rd, and I'm going to turn the meeting over to our chairman, Mr. Melvin McLawhorn. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to welcome all of you to the uh, second day of our workshop, uh, Wednesday, June 3rd. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting now to order. And, and Madam Clerk, will you do the roll call, please? Sure. Chairman McLawhorn. Present. Vice Chair Colson. Commissioner Albright. Here. Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Here. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Here. Commissioner Nunnally. Here. Commissioner Perkins Williams. Here. Commissioner Ward. Here. Commissioner White. Here. Everyone's Here. present. Thank you very much. Uh, as a manager, I think we got some follow up items that uh, we're turning now over to you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. From yesterday, I don't think we have any direct follow up items that came from as a result of the budget workshops. We did have some interaction with, with the commissioners on um, some um, indirect items. I don't know if any of the commissioners want to bring those up or if you just want to go into the first presentation this morning from Pitt County Sheriff Paula Dance for the Sheriff's Office and Detention Center. And then also we have the emergency management and then solid waste following that, those two. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I'll leave that to you. You got one hand. Okay, we have one hand up for Commissioner Perkins Williams. Okay, very good. Commissioner Perkins Williams. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, board members. Can we just get through our scheduled items and go back to the, the bring up stuff later? Very good. I, I think that's a process that we're going to be uh, uh, taking. Commissioner Thank Week. You. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think first, uh, Mr. Manager. Okay. We have um, Sheriff Paula Dance at the podium to, to um, make her presentation. I, I want to say to, uh, before she start, I want to say to Paula Dance, I want to just commend her. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Ms. Dance. I hope you can hear me. Uh, for your comments reference the murder of George Floyd by the Minneapolis Police Department, the officers were the, uh, you expressed that Pitt County Sheriff Department under your leadership would not tolerate uh, that kind of action or any type of racial uh, behavior or any uh, on any citizens of Pitt County, especially uh, the black and brown community, and that you will take immediate action uh, to terminate any employees uh, who displace uh, display any racial motivated behavior. Uh, I, I may have not phrased it completely like you s stated it, but you said something in, in reference to that. So I want to commend you and your department uh, for being proactive and, uh, and, and dealing with uh, uh, this type of uh, situation that occurred and this, that was just upset the whole nation, and quite frankly, the world. So uh, we appreciate your proactiveness and ask that you continue to uh, to do the role and, 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 and display those type of uh, sentiments that you have expressed. With that said, uh, Sheriff Dance, you have the, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, those uh, were my words, and um, I stand by that. Good morning. What a week. What a month. What a year. Um, with saying that, let me get started on my presentation. The mission of the Pitt County Sheriff's Office is to serve, protect, and defend the community with integrity and sound judgment in a manner respectful of the trust that has been placed upon us while preserving the rights and dignity of all. Our vision, our vision is to ensure the future quality of our citizens. The Pitt County Sheriff's Office sets the standard in public safety through innovation and commitment while recruiting a dynamic workforce that meets the profile of the community. We will strategically plan and prepare for the future needs in law enforcement, detention services, and civil process. 
our values. We believe in striving to be a good citizen and beneficial member of our community, state, and nation. It is our duty to serve mankind, to safeguard the lives and properties of others, and to respect the constitutional rights of all. The badge is a symbol of public trust. In obeying the laws of the land and the regulations of the Pitt County Sheriff's Office, in supporting ongoing organizational changes that strengthens our ability and capacity to serve. The Pitt County Sheriff's Office <clears throat> is the hierarchy, is the sheriff. I have two chief deputies, and those two chief deputies oversee the patrol divisions, investigation division, and administration division. The fundamental services provided by the Pitt County Sheriff's Office include civil process unit, communication center, community impact, court security services, crime analysis, crime scene forensics, criminal investigations, detention center, electronic monitoring unit, narcotics, support services, training and standards unit, uniform patrol, victims advocate, and we also have specialized services the civil disturbance team, which you probably all have seen during the um, uh, recently this week, uh, crisis negotiation team, honor guard, and special response team. The community engagement by Pitt County Sheriff's Office includes building bridges, bully prevention workshops, Citizens Academy One, Citizens Academy Two, Citizens on Patrol community watch program, DARE program, mounted patrol, and you can see the rest national night out. Um, in the physical year 2019-20, and I think the screen may show something different, but it's 2019-20, we completed our eighth camp, which was a tremendous success. Previous campers continue to volunteer as camp counselors. We also have a tremendous amount of help from Sheriff's Office employees who volunteer on their days off. The camp operates Monday through Thursday, 7.30 to 5.30 p.m. and is available at a low cost for both taxpayers and parents of attending children. The parents who are financially able to pay for their child's attendance are only asked to contribute $10 a week, which is put back into the camp. Scholarships are provided for families who are unable to contribute due to lack of resources. All this is made possible through donations from local businesses such as Penco Products Incorporated, who ask incorporation, who ask employees for donations, which are then matched by their president and then again by the company. All remaining funds are utilized for the purchase of book bags and supplies in preparation of them going back to school. To highlight some of the performance of the Pitt County Sheriff's Office. We've responded to more than 34,000 or almost five, uh, 35,000 calls from citizens, performed more than 40,000 business checks, and created more than 7,400 reports documenting criminal activity. Our part one violent crime is down by 40%, and we're very proud of that. Um, part one property crimes remain the same, Part two offenses increased by 8%. Now the part one crimes consist of violent and property crimes. Part two crimes are things such as simple assault, curfew offenses, um, loitering, embezzlement, forgery, and things of that nature. Part two is up everywhere, but even with that, we are lower than most. Um, sex offender registration uh, for the year of 2019, deputies conducted a minimum of four checks per sex offender for the year. Additionally, we performed two mandated checks that require the offender that the offender report to our office and present their certified verification letters. Currently, we have 340 registered sex offenders here in our county. 33 of those are newly registered offenders. We've had, we've uh, arrested 34 sex offenders. We've validated um, 213 and we've sent out 465 verification letters. Um, 
When you look at our sex offender arrests, these are our, these show the number of arrests for sex offenders failing to maintain the registration and compliance with the North Carolina sex offender and uh, public protection registration programs. It does not include arrests for unrelated matters. The validations completed monthly on multiple sex offender files to ensure that they're complete and accurate, which also confirms entries into NCIC and DCIN. Those entries assist in providing law enforcement agencies throughout the country necessary sex offender registration information. And the North Carolina SBI is providing up-to-date information for the public on the North Carolina sex offender registry. The verification letters are sent to the address that the offender provides uh, twice per year. And then that, when we send those letters, that person has to return that verification letter back to the sheriff's office in person within three days of receipt. Um, CCW applications, this, this will show the CCW applications processed. Um, 2019, 2020, there were 2,031 that were processed. Gun permits process, they're up, uh, it was 5,499 in the, this fiscal year. Handgun. Sure. Can you define the CCW? Can you define what CCW is? CCW is our concealed carry permits. Uh, the purchase permits are what I'm referring to or the gun permits that are processed. Handgun purchase permits, citizens pay $5, which the county keeps for, for, the, for our processing of paperwork. Concealed handgun permits that are new, the citizens pay $90. $45 goes to the state of North Carolina and the county keeps $45 for our processing, the paperwork and fingerprinting fees. The concealed handgun permit renewals, uh, the citizens pay $75. $40 goes to the state of North Carolina and the county keeps $35. Uh, due to COVID-19, fingerprinting services were suspended for temporarily, which resulted in a drop of the new concealed carry permit applications. The performance um, at the Pitt County Sheriff's Office. Um, in this fiscal year of 2020, the Sheriff's Office received 20, over 23,000 civil and criminal, criminal processes. 20,000, over 20,000 were served with a 87% service rate. Civil papers has been down since the courts have been on the modified schedule due to COVID-19. That is going to generate a backlog of papers, particularly evictions, once things start to go back to normal. We'll move on to our budget. Sheriff's Office will be re requesting two deputy positions. Those positions are imperative for us to have because of the new opening of the courthouse or, or a courtroom in which I believe Judge Perez would be filling that position. Um, I would have to, by statute, uh, maintain security in that courtroom. And quite frankly, I don't have the positions to do so. So I would be requesting um, that. And that will be the uh, gist of any request outside of what the county manager has has um, proposed. Um, we recognize the unfortunate situation that we are all facing um, due to COVID-19. Uh, we did not provide many needed items in our presentation. The Sheriff's Office wants, wants to do its part in helping the county to get through this pandemic. Um, again, um, those two positions will be assigned to the courtroom security unit um, with the additional judge um, that has been added to Pitt County. Um, I wanna talk about some of our accomplishments. The body cams. I know you all are probably interested to know where we're at with that. Uh, we received uh, $100,000 in grant funding for that and the county provided um, over $200,000. And after long, a long testing process, Axon has been selected as the vendor and we are in the process of a contract as we speak. So hopefully we will have that um, very, very soon. 
I'll move on to the Pitt County Detention Center. Um, as you can see, the federal housing, <clears throat> um, this kind of shows um, where we've been and where we're at as it relates to that. Um, in the year, fiscal year 1920, there was projections of um, 900, over $900,000. We actually collected 1.2 million with an overage of $239,000. Our inmate population on average this year has been 393. Some of the programs that we started in our detention center, um, and this was the, the programs that we were able to get funds through grants on. Um, one in particular is WHERE. WHERE is the Women Empowerment and Recovery Program. Um, we've had, we had 21 um, participants. Of those participants, five received prison time, three returned, to, three of those returned to PCDC. Um, five did not complete or dropped out of the program. Four are out on good standing and four are unknown at this time. In the SHARP program, which is the Sheriff's Heroin Addiction Recovery Program, we had 37 former participants. Six received uh, prison time. Um, some of that prison time has pres been presumably shortened due to the participation in this program. Three returned to, out of those, three of those returned to P uh, PCDC. 15 discharged and are, in still, are still in good standing and 13 are unknown at this time. With the SHARP program, we had a, a parent's day, which was a huge success. This event lasted from 9 a.m. till 12. Four participants of the SHARP program were able to spend time with their children and take the first steps in rebuilding their family bonds and relations. And that is the end of my presentation, unless there are any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Sheriff. I uh, you know, you, 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 you talked about the um, body cameras um, and that you anticipate to have those very, very soon. I, I just want to know uh, the definition of very, very soon. I'm hoping that this will, meaning that you're going to have it this month. Uh, are you going to have it uh, before this, uh, this year's out? What do you? We're going to have it before the year's out. Yes, absolutely. We've, we've got the contract. Um, the contract has been sent. Um, and it's just a, a, a matter of um, placing the order and, and getting them shipped. Okay. So does that sound like maybe I, I, I hear you. I think that's very crucial. Uh, and and uh, you said before the end of the year, you think within the next month or so? Yes, sir. We anticipate them very, very soon. I, I can't give you a definitive date, but okay. we anticipate them very, very soon. Very uh, good. We look forward to having them, especially in these trying times. Sheriff, I think the chairman may have been trying to clarify before the end of the fiscal year or the calendar year. Oh, before the calendar. Yeah, well, is it, it? It would be in the next. Well, we're we'll signed the contract year. before. We'll have uh, ordered them by the end of this fiscal year, Chairman. Um, we're hoping they can get them shipped by that point as well. Very good. Uh, Scott, do we have any? Uh, I see, if you can keep this hand, I, I think I can see the hands uh, now on my screen. Uh, that's the time. Commissioner, is that Commissioner Albright? Um, not on our screen, unless it's indicated on well, yours. It just, it just went on. Who, who, do, you have, who do you have? Uh, um, we have no hands up at this time, unless there's any commissioners, you have any questions or comments or input? You have no comments or input. Well, if not, uh, Sheriff, I want to thank you for your very fine presentation and we'll be looking to uh, what we can do in terms of those uh, officers that you requested. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Next, Mr. Chairman, we have um, emergency management. Okay. We have Mr. Randy Gentry, our emergency Gentry. management director. Very good. Mr. Gentry, you have the floor. Good morning, Chairman and Commissioners, and uh, thank you for this time. I would like to uh, start by recognizing uh, all the great employees that are in the emergency management office. And uh, I have some of the staff here with me this morning, but uh, I'd also like to point out that uh, in support of uh, our EMS section, uh, the chairman of the EMS Oversight Committee, uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Brown is here, as well as uh, Dr. Patella, our medical advisor, um, medical director for our EMS system, uh, showing their support for uh, our program. Um, I have two presentations. One uh, is the overview of our emergency, emergency management section. And I'll start with that and then we'll follow up with the EMS and the fire district tax. Um, emergency management comprises of four different uh, divisions, uh, our administrative staff uh, that we assist with the uh, different departments of the county, municipalities, and throughout the community to ensure uh, that the county and its residents have the resources and inf information that they need to mitigate, prepare, respond, and recover from emergencies, disasters, and significant events. Uh, of those divisions comprised of the fire marshal section, EMS 911, and the uh, emergency management section. Uh, fire marshal, uh, we have uh, one, um, one of our deputy directors is the fire marshal, and then we have two part-time fire marshals that assist him in performing the uh, fire inspections throughout the county, uh, review of, of the construction plans, investigate fires, and we respond to different types of emergencies uh, throughout the county. Uh, our major accomplishments in the fire section this year, uh, we have six volunteer fire departments that received a, a reduction uh, in their ratings from the state, which in turn helps our citizens and their property uh, insurance rates. So we really are excited about that. And we have uh, another uh, department in the, next, in the upcoming year that will also be reevaluated and hopefully we'll continue that trend of reducing uh, those uh, class ratings. Um, I will cover the fire district uh, increase request uh, in the next presentation, uh, but we do have uh, five different uh, volunteer fire departments that are seeking uh, some funds to uh, purchase new trucks uh, in the upcoming budget year. Uh, and those departments are Bell Arthur, Blackjack, Clark's Neck, Sharp Point, and Staten House will be uh, requesting that $25,000 uh, to assist in purchasing trucks. Um, I'll cover that in the next presentation. Our EMS section uh, is comprised of a deputy, deputy director, uh, four paramedic supervisors that uh, assist in operating the uh, county EMS system. We have a collections officer, a community paramedic, uh, four senior paramedics, and then we have the 12 full-time paramedics, and then we have a part-time pool of uh, part-time people that help staff our county system. Um, the county operates the EMS system in the Bethel location, Pactolis, and our peak time truck where it is housed in Simpson, but it, it's a, we're able to move that peak time truck wherever within the county uh, to meet the system demands. Um, for the rest of our EMS uh, protection across the county, uh, the county contracts with eight different nonprofit EMS departments. Um, the county has the direct operation of the, of the two that I just mentioned previous. Uh, we provide par paramedic level care uh, in addition with our community uh, paramedic program uh, to help uh, reduce some of the transports to the hospital. Uh, community, community paramedic program is a, a very uh, vital piece to our entire system. Um, and funding is by countywide EMS tax and I will go over that in the next presentation. Uh, over the uh, past year, the accomplishments for the EMS section is we launched the uh, AVL, which is the uh, automatic vehicle locator, and that's been doing very well, where we can uh, position trucks throughout the county based on uh, need and, and uh, calls for service. Uh, in the last year, we, have, uh, we were able to purchase two new ambulances uh, to add to our uh, fleet, 
uh, the first ambulance we uh, placed in Aden to replace the old unit, and then the, the one that we just received uh, is replaced the peak time truck and uh, is housed in our Simpson uh, Simpson Volunteer Fire Department. In addition to the uh, ambulances that we purchased, uh, we were able to uh, we put in the new uh, striker stretchers, which uh, is a, a battery driven device so it takes the uh, the lifting off of the uh, paramedics to save their backs and it's, it's a safer option uh, in uh, managing uh, patient care uh, had great success with the community paramedic program matter of fact the county is uh, in a, an awards program at this time uh, and as a part of that award package the community paramedic is one of those programs that's being spotlighted uh, and then we've been busy with the COVID-19 mitigation and response. Uh, it's new to all of us and uh, uh, our, our, the uh, paramedics and the staff have done a, a, a uh, stellar job in uh, trying to navigate the unknown. Uh, as y'all know, the uh, response or the uh, direction that comes out from different levels of government uh, kind of changes all along the way, but our staff has adapted and, and, and everyone has uh, been safe throughout all of this and uh, doing a fantastic job. Um, this is the, uh, the picture of our new uh, ambulance that we received this year. Uh, and the last unit that we uh, received has the new logo on the side. You'll see that Pitt County Emergency Management logo. So that's the only one in the county, but uh, we put that on the new one and, and moving forward, that will be the, the logo. And then of course, you'll see the stretcher sticking out the back of the ambulance. That's the new device um, that we were able to purchase in the last two uh, trucks. Well, that'll come up in the next um, presentation. Um, 911 division, we have a deputy director, director in charge of that. Uh, then we have operations manager, two supervisors, four shift leaders, and 16 telecommunicators. And we are fully staffed at this time, which is very exciting. Uh, they do a fantastic job in receiving the calls for emergency service throughout the county. Uh, also, the, their accomplishments for this year is the... Uh, uh, they are a, a vital part of the automatic vehicle locator AVL system that we, we launched. Uh, and then the Freedom application gives the, uh, it's a app that goes on uh, mobile devices where uh, our dispatcher, not dispatchers, but our, our, our volunteer fire and our, our EMS personnel are able to look at the calls for service on their uh, smartphones. I'm very excited to uh, announce that uh, yesterday we completed, or Motorola completed the testing on our paging uh, site down in Grimesland, uh, and that was the final piece of the paging system. So all of the operational, uh, Motorola has checked off on it that it is working as designed. Uh, I have been in com communication with the fire chiefs in that area, and they are just pleasantly surprised that uh, that system is up and running and they can hear their pages, they get the tones, and. Um, I think that will uh, allow us to move on uh, from the paging because everything is working uh, as designed. So I'm excited about that. Also this past year, we had an upgrade in our uh, 911 communication center with new consoles. Uh, very nice uh, uh, change for the room, uh, modern equipment. Uh, everything's laid out in a professional way where it's, uh, ease of use. Uh, so if you get a chance, please come down and, and see our 911 communication center. Uh, after their uh, most recent upgrade. And there's a picture of our, our new consoles uh, in 911. Uh, I just mentioned the, the paging site and that's the device that's located in Grimesland uh, for our paging system. Uh, emergency management division uh, comprised of a director, office manager and emergency manager planner. Um, uh, we've been busy with the COVID-19 mitigation and response, as well as we did have the one storm uh, last fall, Dorian. Um, and then this past uh, December, we had our very first holiday safety fair, and I think it was a, a, a huge success, had a great response from the community, uh, and we plan on continuing to have that uh, each year. These are some of the assets that we've received uh, from the state and the federal government that allow us to, to do some of the things that we do in emergency management. Um, 
it's um, we house the, this equipment here in Pitt County, but uh, it's also can be requested from uh, across the state, and, and, and we would loan loan these pieces out as well as if we needed additional pieces, we could request from the state, and uh, they would send us the same resources. Uh, as a part of owning these assets, uh, we do have a, a responsibility of keeping them uh, in top maintenance and, and making sure that they're right and ready uh, should we need them. Uh, hopefully this year we'll, we will take uh, delivery of a uh, what's called a prime mover, which is a large truck to safely pull these trailers uh, that we have uh, loaded with uh, emergency management equipment. Uh, and we've been using... Uh, for instance, our message boards during this COVID-19 and just messaging to the to the citizens to uh, in the early stages, you know, the message was go home, stay home. And, and we did some of that. And anytime we need to get the message out to the community, we can place them anywhere uh, throughout the county. And I will cover that. Well, I've already covered that, but we have five um, contribution requests from volunteer fire departments. Is there any questions about the first part? of the emergency management. Uh, well, let, me, let me just say off the top that I wanted to just thank you, uh, uh, Randy, for your outstanding uh, work that you and your staff uh, are doing in, in, in providing critical services for uh, the citizens of Pitt County, especially during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. You've been on the on the um, field, on the battlefield, and and you display some outstanding uh, services for us, and we appreciate that. Uh, do we have any um, hands up, Scott? Yes, sir. We have um, Commissioner Floyd Huggins and Commissioner Perkins Williams. Okay, Commissioner Floyd Huggins, first place. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I uh, say uh, ditto to uh, Mr. Uh, Dentry as the um, chairman said uh, the good work that EMS is doing. I don't have a question, but I would like for you to explain to um, to us uh, about the automatic vehicle locator system, how important that is, uh, so our commissioners will know just what, what that is. Yes, ma'am. In a nutshell, the uh, AVL allows uh, our system to respond the closest EMS truck to wherever the call for service is. Instead of putting uh, trucks in buildings and sitting in stationary positions waiting to respond to a call, uh, the, the system identifies the truck that is actually closest in, from distance to the call for service. So we're actually responding that closest unit to the, the need instead of dispatching from a, a static building. Okay, thank you. So uh, all the trucks have GPS locators on them uh, so that the dispatchers can see that on the screen and then the, the computer does the analysis or, or they do the, the, the distance. And so what, whatever truck is the closest, that's what responds to that call. So it's, it's better for the citizen. Yes, that's what I wanted you to, uh, to say. Thank you. And to add to, to add to that, currently the, the system would be the Pitt County's eight nonprofit squads in the county's two um, county ran squads. Um, we're talking with the city. Um, they've been offered the opportunity to jump on the AVL. I think they're considering that or in discussions on that. Would you say that's correct, Randy? That is correct. Okay. All EMS trucks in the county, uh, Greenville, do not, they do not have uh, AVL currently, but it is available if they choose. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Perkin Williams. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gentry, for what you do. I have just one quick question, I believe. Um, I'm always like to know, are there any dead spots for communication within the county? Because I have far reaching areas such as um, clock neck. And are there any spots that cannot receive uh, communications? That I'm you know, aware. Commissioner Perkins Williams, we um, I'm going to let Randy and Jimmy Hodges, our 911 director, answer this. But we have um, implemented a very, very robust um, radio and paging system. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we're going to be coming to you with a report on that, and it's probably about eight to ten years in the making. But this last paging site for the Clark's Neck area was the last component of that that has been implemented. 
other than that, we, um, we now have a very robust system. Um, the far majority of the county is covered with um, radio and, and paging capabilities. We will show mapping of that and um, basically what we've done over the years. I don't know if Randy or Jimmy want to add anything to that. Yes, ma'am. Yesterday I rode around with Motorola uh, to do the paging testing for the system in Clark's Neck, Grimes and Simpson area. And I can personally say that there was no dead spots. Everything tested very well. And that Grimes and site is now providing great coverage uh, for the eastern part of the county. Okay, thank you very much. Because I do know that there was some um, departments in, our, in, in this area that did not communicate accurately or whatever, but there was some dead spots. Box. And I, I think all citizens should be able to have access to PMEC, PCEM. And uh, I look forward to hearing the rest of your presentation because I do have questions on that. Commercial, uh, Commissioner Perkins Williams, I really believe you're referring to some of the, the previous conversations as it related to the paging in that Clark's Neck, Grimesland area and the system we just completed and tested. Uh, eliminated all of that dead spot area. And I've received information from the chiefs of those areas uh, about their uh, excitement okay. of the completion of that project and, and the things that it, it's cleared up. So uh, they are, are, are hearing their pages and hearing their calls for service. What about Bethel? I, I, I hadn't been aware of any problems in Bethel so far as receiving or understanding any of the radio transmissions or paging. Okay, because I, I do know that there's some communication dead spot when I, I drive over there. Uh, I can't even get signals, but I just want to make sure that's all. Yes, yes so ma'am. Cell we, phone we, coverage would be different from our radio or paging capabilities for emergency services, emergency management. Um, again, we'll, our county engineer, Tim Corley, will be coming forward in the near future to make a comprehensive report because we have probably spent eight to $10 million, I'm going to say off the top of my head, through two phases of implementation of this system over the years. And like right now, I, I, as I just said a moment ago, this is a very robust system, probably one of the, the best in the state. Would you agree, Randy? Okay. I would agree that we have one of the better communication systems in the state. Okay. And, I, and I'm not aware of any dead spots to speak of uh, that's been brought to our attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Randy. Uh, for you. Any other uh, comments, uh, Scott, that to, uh, for me? No, sir, there are no hands raised. I think um, Mr. Gentry does have a, some more um, information to present to the board, if you will allow him. Very okay. good. Um, hey, All right, I, I'm going to go over the <clears throat> EMS financial update that I gave at the 18th uh, board meeting, but I'm just going to run through that. Um, I've previously mentioned about the eight contract, uh, nonprofit contracted squads, as well as the county squads that we have. Um, our EMS tax taxes are comprised of everything outside the city of Greenville. So like I showed you at the board meeting, um, the area in the gray is the taxable area for the county that supports our system. So as the, count, the uh, city grows, our, our tax base goes away for our EMS system. Uh, this is a chart of our, our call volume over the last year um, by squad. Um, it represents about a little over 10,000 calls for service for our system. This is a breakdown of, of, of the, uh, the county dollars that we give to the nonprofits to operate their squads. And this is a, a cost per call uh, breakout. So you can see what it costs from county dollars uh, to respond from each of the uh, nonprofits. And Randy, just to, to point out, can go back, um, maybe two slides back. So your your higher call volume squads are on the, to the left, Aiden, Winterville, Eastern Pines, and then the ones in the middle are mid range. And then if you go to the, the far right, you can put that slide back up. I can't see it. Thank um, PIO. Thank you. Then you're on your far right, your your Bell Arthur and Fountain squads in terms of their, their call volume on the previous slide show their, their very low call volume. And because of that, in this slide you're looking at now, their per call cost is extremely high compared to, if you look at the far left in Aiden, Winterville, 
has an average run cost of $243, $278, compared to a fountain cost of $1,763 per call because they make so few calls. Just wanted to point that differential out. The, the taxes started for the uh, EMS tax district in 2002 uh, and, at a point oh three, and then over the years, there's been a couple of adjustments. Uh, and the last increase was in 2012, and that was a uh, also a, a reevaluation year, and that was held at a, a revenue neutral rate. Um, then, then we get into our, our, our revenues uh, for our EMS system. And over the years, uh, has continually to uh, increase. Um, that 2016, uh, just to note, there's a note there that uh, that was an audit adjustment uh, that kind of raised that. But it was uh, the the audit adjustment was four thousand eight four hundred thousand eighty nine dollars. Uh, so that's what makes that look, look, look a little different there. So one of the one of the drivers in this budget, going back to that private, previous screen, is the fact that our EMS revenue collection is, is dropping, declining, um, not dramatically, but it is declining. Thus, we are needing a source to, to make that up. Um, Brian, you want to talk about some of the factors involved in that decline? Uh, yes, uh, on the transport fee, on the in the EMS fund, the transport fee is our second largest revenue source. And um, as, sorry, I'm, I'm mumbled, as the, most of the folks, uh, not most, but a, a, a larger part, part of the folks that we're transporting already have a difficult time paying the fee. And um, as you know, we do go and respond to all calls that we receive, and we are limited in the steps that we can take in collecting that revenue if those individuals are, um, are, are, are what we call bill patient. Um, so currently, um, we can set them up on a payment plan and we have been researching, um, unfortunately, the additional enforcement options that we've researched have coincided at the same time as the COVID-19 um, pandemic has been going on. So a lot of the areas that we can look into as potential uh, enforcement are some of the very areas that are right now suspended or deferred uh, methods that you'll see with your utility companies and your mortgage companies and your cell phone companies. Um, so those are some those are some options that we can look into, but but ultimately a lot of these people, uh, even with enforced collections, we're very limited in what we can actually go out and collect. So so right now in terms of those enforced actions, with property taxes through the tax department, we our toolbox does have tools in there for enforced collections, whether wage garnishment, um, debt set off, um, whether um, just the, those different like tools. As a policy, the board of county commissioners in terms of the EMS bills have asked us not to be, not to use aggressive techniques, but that would be something for the board to reconsider if, if you wanted us to be more aggressive in, in this area. So something for another, another day possibly, but just wanted to point that out. And this, this slide just indicates where our, our, our payer mix is and um, the Medicaid, uh, Medicare has, has been down 10% from 2017 to now. Uh, and, just, and this just shows our payer mix where the self payers are going up and um, others are going down. Right, so if your self payers are, are going up, the, the column in blue, then your, whether insurance, Medicaid or Medicare, which are pretty much a guaranteed payment, um, the, the, the self pay is the, harder to collect because we're actually then asking for voluntary action or payment on the person's behalf that used the service. In the previous presentation, I went over the EMS and, and these, this is the, where our, our expenses go to run our system. And it just breaks out the different uh, groups and, and th that we need to, to run our system. So I'll move on to the next slide and it just shows our expenses each and every year go up. And a lot of the rising costs is, is really about running the system, uh, about the, uh, the capital expenses that we have in, in buying equipment, new equipment, and then personnel is always a rising cost 
and that's what's continuing to drive that. And, and this is showing that a little over six million uh, is forecasted for the end of this, this uh, fiscal year. Um, since 2018, we've added four full-time paramedic positions. Uh, we went from 17 uh, full-time personnel to 21, and uh, in 2018, they purchased four remounted ambulances. Uh, 19, uh, we added another four senior paramedics, uh, increased the full time from 21 to 24. And that's when we replaced the, uh, the peak time truck uh, in service in that February. Uh, but the, the peak time truck has really been a great benefit to the system. Uh, and it, it allows us to serve our citizens better, but also that truck is, is, we're able to move that truck around the county based on the busyness of the system. If units get out of place, we can move that truck to fill that void so that we have continual coverage for our citizens. And then we also uh, started the purchasing process for the AVL uh, system and associated equipment, equipment and software. Randy, if I can make a comment on that peak time truck. We um, had had several meetings with the city of Greenville regarding, I guess, mutual aid of them coming out into the county and the total number of trips several hundred trips per year that they were actually coming out into the county's district or, or jurisdiction. Um, we were also going into the city, but at a far fewer number of trips compared to what they were coming out. And they were asked us to look at somehow um, equalizing that or to lessening the number. Um, so we instituted the, the peak time trip, mainly in the Eastern Pines area, correct? Um, that was the primary, but it, 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 other parts of the county sometime we would have to, but mainly it was in that Eastern corridor where we have uh, slowed that uh, response from Greenville down. But just a handful of calls. And matter of fact, we hadn't even had a conversation with the city since the fall of last year. Right, so the impl implementation of that peak time truck really has pretty much solved that issue with the city, correct? Right, and AVL was a, a, a good piece to put into that to help that because uh, AVL is, is recommending that closest truck so uh, with the peak time truck and the new technology that we're utilizing with AVL, it allows us to make sure that, that we're covering the county with our county units and our contracted uh, squads. I think their issue was they were using city paid resources through city taxes and so forth to come out and respond to an inordinate number of calls in the county compared to the number that we were going in um, in comparison. So that's part of that. And we do have the opportunity to assist Greenville. We do come in on occasion, but uh, their response to the county is just down to a handful, uh, very rare uh, since this past fall. So uh, between the AVL system and our peak time truck, we've pretty much alle alleviated all of that. Thank you. Uh, 2020, you know, I've already mentioned that we purchased the new ambulances, the two striker units, and just to give you an indication, this. These uh, striker stretchers are about $40,000 a piece, but they're well worth every dollar that they uh, it cost us to purchase simply because of, uh, it allows us to not put all the, the lifting on the uh, paramedics. So we, we uh, don't have that potential for injured employees. It's also safer for the patient, uh, the way that uh, you uh, utilize an, uh, the uh, stretcher system. So it's just a, a great piece of equipment, but there is a cost to that. Uh, and we'll hopefully as we move forward, that will be the, the standard in all of our trucks. Um, I've already mentioned about the AVL implementation um, and then another driver for our increased expenditures is workers' compensation cost for our contract squads because we cover that for the eight different uh, squads. Uh, just want to mention that the uh, Vital Health Foundation uh, and the support of our community community paramedic pro program since this, uh, since the beginning they have been a great supporter and also uh, annual grant funding has gone towards that. Um, I mentioned earlier that the county pursued the National Civic uh, League Award. Uh, the community paramedic is a part of that, uh, and we are very thankful for that partnership with the uh, Vital Health Foundation. Um, this just shows our expenditures and our, and our revenues over the years. And uh, of course the, the expenditure line, which is the blue line continues to rise and our uh, revenue uh, is not quite making it to the blue line. Uh, so that's why we are here. 
uh, to talk about the increased, uh, we need to increase the revenue as necessary uh, to, to continue the current level of service. Uh, we've talked about the drivers for this uh, need for the increase is the transport building revenues are down, uh, the addition of the peak time service ambulance and additional paramedic positions in the previous years. The oversight committee on March 12th uh, met and discussed uh, this, is, this uh, uh, need for the increased revenue. Uh, and just like everybody else at uh, the county budget, as well as you know, state and federal, uh, we all face similar funding challenges. And uh, we uh, gave several options to the oversight committee. Uh, the oversight committee approved and recommended a tax increase from the 4.6 to the 6.2 um, to adequately fund the current uh, system. Uh, and then the county manager recommends the 5.95 cent tax rate uh, to fund the system without cutting services to squads. And, and the only difference there is, is just not quite as much going to the capital, capital reserve uh, at the 5.95, but it does cover and um, maintains the level of service that we have today in our system. We'll move on to the uh, fire district request. We have three different fire departments requesting a tax increase. Uh, as I stated on the uh, 18th meeting, Blackjack, Red Oak, and Simpson are requesting that increase. Blackjack currently is at 7.9. Uh, they're requesting an 8.9 cent tax rate. Uh, and they were, do, were requesting this to replace a 50 year old fire truck. Uh, and they, they currently have a, um, a part time uh, fireman that during the week at their station and they would like to cover their station every day. So that's another reason for their request. And I'd like to mention for the blackjack, uh, when we did the making crossing adjustments to the fire lines back uh, last fall, uh, they did lose fire district. So they lost revenue uh, because of that. Simpson, uh, they're currently at the 6.5. They're requesting 6.65 uh, to uh, cover the rising cost of replacement of equipment and the maintenance cost. And they have recently uh, added a daytime fireman for, for their fire district. Uh, and that will help support that program. Red Oaks requesting an increase from seven uh, to 9.5. Um, they have not had requested a, a rate adjustment since 2006. Then they would like to expand their fire station, uh, uh, add on some, some rooms to that, and uh, also re rising equipment costs uh, and replacement and maintenance uh, for their uh, fire department. That's all I have, but I'll be glad to answer any questions. So, Mr. Chairman, you have three hands up Commissioner Nunley, Commissioner Perkins Williams, and Commissioner White. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, Randy, for that, I, I, I will certainly begin to the hands. Uh, but, but uh, Scott, and I want to share this with you as well. Uh, uh, you're talking about uh, aggressively um, uh, or non-aggressively collection of, 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 of monies, of fees for services uh, in our community. I, I think that during this time, especially the COVID-19 pandemic, we should, as a county, uh, Scott, to, to not continue to not to be so aggressively in collect, collecting money for people who are trying to get emergency services. Um, this is just an unusual time. People are not working. And um, I do want to ask a question here about the CARES Act funding, Scott. And I noticed that Randy talked about various um, uh, grant funding from VIDA and other places that maybe some of this money can be utilized. Uh, in his services, can that can that money not be utilized in some of those services? And this, Scott, for you to kind of comment on. Yes, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. The CARES Act funding can be used to pay for 100% um, of public safety related cost, position costs. So EMS would be a um, eligible cost. So from beginning, I guess, whenever the the COVID nineteen response period began, let's say hypothetically March first, March first. Through, through present, we could capture 100% um, of those costs, personnel costs within the system. Now, if you use that to, um, to offset this, this budget, we basically would be plugging the, the hole in the budget for one year. A year from now, you wouldn't have those funds and you would then be 
where you are today. Brian, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, that, that sums it up correctly. Well, thank you. I, I, I just think this is a different time and this is a time of, uh, oh, that we, we got to try to help our citizens as much as possible, especially those uh, who are in low income areas and, and, and can't afford it. Uh, thank you, uh, Randy. Now, Scott, uh, who, do, who do you have first on, on, on the- Commissioner Nunley. Commissioner Nunley. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thanks, Randy, for your presentation. Um, real quick, just a question. Do we know or have a reason for the reduction of collections from Medicare and Medicaid on those, um, on those, on those fees? Is there any, are we getting, are we just billing, billing out those more to, to, uh, to clients individually or, or is it a coverage issue? What, what, what's the situation there? Uh, Commissioner Nunley, to my, to my knowledge, it's it's not an issue on the Medicaid or Medicare side. I think we're just seeing an increase in the amount of uh, direct bill patients. Um, my staff has taken every step that we can on the insurance side. There's some procedural steps that sometimes are present a hiccup, um, but we have um, we have avenues and methods in place to to overcome those hiccups, and we do. So you may miss a you may miss an April due to procedural, but we catch it up in May. But our, our biggest issue is those individuals who do not have types of insurance. Um, we have recently partnered with um, EMS and the community paramedic. We have, um, uh, I'll put it to you bluntly, we have what we call frequent riders. And, and if we are seeing that we have people who frequently are calling EMS, um, we have turned them over to the community paramedic to work with those individuals to try to get them um, more healthy so that they don't need our services. But a lot of those people are the folks who do not pay, who do not have income, do not work with us. But if they call, we respond. Okay, thank you. Um, and my, my last question has to do with um, the fire tax, um, the proposed fire district tax rate increases. Um, and first, first with, um, with Simpson seems to be um, a relatively uh, modest fee increase. Um, Brian, what would what would that amount to? Um, I guess for a typical taxpayer, what what's that looking like for for Simpson? And I guess you're you asking on an individual home basis to 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 help bring them, you know, into a place where they're getting where they need to be to provide services for that region. So let's say a hundred thousand dollar house would go from. $65 to $66 and 50 cents. Is my math right? Yeah, that, that's your simple math. Yes. Um, and obviously it's going to, within any one of these um, fire districts, the impact of any tax increase is going to vary depending on the particular property, but yes, that's correct math. And then Randy, would you, of course you're sitting in the chair where you can maybe see answer the, the need question, but um, would you would you say that that there's a need for for Simpson to um, to have this to, so that they can provide better services for that district? I would say that Simpson's in the same boat as the, the rest of us with the rising cost of equipment and, and what it costs to maintain and replace. Um, I can see that uh, probably most anybody could need it or could use an increase to continue their, their level of service because nothing is getting cheaper. And I'll add that both Randy, myself, and Brian sat down with the leadership of all three of these departments asking for a rate increase to discuss the rate increase and to see if there was any way that it could be um, put off or lowered or, and each department fully justified the request. And we said we would then bring it forward to you for your consideration. Okay. All right. Thank you, Beth. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner. The next person, um, Scott. Yes, Mr. Chairman, Mary Perkins Williams. Commissioner uh, Williams. Thank you, Mr. Gentry, for what you do in responding to the citizen at a time of crisis. I would like to know um, at some point where does medic, the, the, because North Carolina did not accept the uh, Medicaid expansion, they uh, denied the Medicaid extension. Where does it fit into this budget? 
I know this Medicaid is up here, but we are making up for that Medicaid expansion for those people who cannot uh, pay for their services. <clears throat> I'll defer to Brian. It, it, it does not really, uh, Commissioner Perkins Williams, it does not really factor into per se the budget, the, the expansion of Medicaid. Um, I'm not necessarily sure if the people who are unable to pay and who do not have Medicaid or Medicare necessarily would receive these services if the expansion had been in place. Um, so I, I'm not at any point to speak on what benefit or, or, or any kind of impact or the, the lack of Medicaid expansion would have had on the situation in the EMS fund. I think we may still have been in this same predicament um, this fiscal year, even if the expansion had gone into place. I know it does impact the hospital, but I just wondered, did, did it filter into this particular segment of the budget at all? But um, Medicaid, exp I wouldn't, wouldn't have been aware if it wasn't for the annual conferences, but the uh, other count states have thanked us for not uh, re accepting the Medicaid expansion. And um, that means it impacts on the tax payers. So I was just wondering where it fit in and I was trying to find out other than the hospital. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next, you have Commissioner White. Okay, hey, um, mine is comments, not so much as questions. Um, Blackjack and Simpson have um, both reached out to me in explanation of their tax increases. And um, Mr. Gentry you already did touch on this. Last year, Blackjack lost um, a portion of their tax base when they did the redistricting to save some homeowners on their um, fire insurance rating. And also, um, Blackjack has recently gotten a better fire rating themselves. So people in that area, their homeowner's insurance is able to go down. So that will offset the cost of the tax increase. Um, I spoke with Chief Hanley and the treasurer of um, the Blackjack Fire Department about that. So I just wanted to throw those comments out there. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner White, any, anybody else? Scott? Yes, Commissioner Ward, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Ward. Um, yes, um, I, I just wanted to uh, put this forward to request a presentation later on after we finish the budget workshops. Um, and, and here's some about the, I understand about, because I, I used to be on the EMS uh, committee, the, um, the difference in the local areas and how much more expensive it is. But I'd like for us to take a look at that a little more closely. When you see a, a smaller EMS area, you know, being the highest cost, way, way higher than the ones that are making so many more calls. And I don't know if there's something we can do about that. And I'm just asking that maybe we take a look at that, Scott, later on at a meeting in a presentation. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Ward, we'd be happy to bring that back to you. And um, um, we'd really like board direction on that. Can that, that can be a highly, we, we've, been there, done that three times as manager in my 19 years, and each three times we've brought it before the board publicly it has not been um, well received. But if the board would like us to look at the, um, the 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 system from the 10 squads in terms of the more the ones who are performing a higher number of calls at lower cost compared to the the other end of the spectrum, and what options could be considered, um, I think in in the past we had talked about the literal combining and shutting down of, of squads or districts. I don't, I think in today's environment where there's options that we've vetted internally, such as maybe just putting a peak time ambulance in a district rather than shutting it down. So there are, there are some options out there that could be considered, but we would really want the majority of the board to direct that being brought back on the agenda because it would be a um, number, time number four that we would be having this conversation. and. Um, Thank you. Very good. Do we have anybody else? Uh, um, yeah, well, Commissioner Ward still has her hand up. I don't know if she want to speak again. Yes, I put my I put my hand back up. 
Um, I don't want to cause any kind of a controversy. It may be just something that we may just need to hear a report, Scott, kind of from what you just said. I know that it's, you know, I, I like the EMS being local, and I think they look after their citizens. They do a good job raising money, uh, taking care of themselves. I like the way they run things. I just, you know, you know, want to make sure that those things are going and they're getting as much help from us as they need. And, yes, I'm very aware of how many times we've talked about this. So it may be something that we'll just talk about later and see if it's necessary or if we're just in this boat and we're going to have to stay afloat. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, we have Commissioner White with her hand up. Commissioner White. Um, yes, yeah, thank you. I would also kind of like some explanation. Um, I'm not quite sure that this topic has come before the board since I've been up here, but I have had, um, I would say, multiple, multiple people um, involved in EMS reach out to me over um, – for lack of a better word right now, the un what they consider the unfairness of funding, you know, high volume versus low volume squads and stuff. And if nothing else, just so we can kind of get um, maybe an explanation of everything. That way, um, when asked questions, you know, I can answer and, you know, not have to um, – refer it to county staff or whatever um I, I kind of would appreciate just i mean even if we don't make any changes just maybe a presentation on this so i can better understand it and maybe the general public can also yes ma'am we can maybe prepare a presentation to bring back um after budget is adopted to maybe fully explain the how the EMS, ems system operates how it's funded and and so forth if the board's in agreement to that okay thank you Sounds good. Uh, anybody else? Yes, sir. That's, sir. That's it? Yes, sir. Well, thank you very much, uh, Randy. Uh, and as we continue, uh, Scott, uh, I think we're moving ahead of, of time. Uh, do we want to take a break at this point, or do we want to just move now to John Dembre? Um, I'll defer to the group. Um, Vice Chairman Colson, would you like to, you're obviously here on the dais. Would Doesn't you like matter to, to me? I would say continue on unless there's a request to um, take a hand up. We have a hand up for Commissioner Perkins Williams. Commissioner Perkins Williams. I'd like to see us move on while we're moving smooth. Sounds yes. great. <laughs> I have no problem. Uh, uh, is John Demery here, uh, Scott? Yes, sir. He's at the podium now. Okay. Come, uh, Mr. Demery, you got the floor. Thank you, commissioners. Good morning. Here to talk about solid waste and recycling budget presentation. Uh, we have a mission statement out at solid waste and it's to provide everyone in the community with waste disposal of capacity, waste collection services and waste reduction activities. We want to increase our efficiency and cost effective our solid waste program. We strive to meet and establish waste reduction goals. We want to just decrease improper waste disposal, and we want to protect the public health and the environment. Uh, last September, we came before you um, and uh, gave you some oversights and some changes that we were gonna take place, that would take place. Um, we have um, made these changes. Uh, we implemented a fee increase last year in last year's budget. We added uh, solid waste to the detailed monthly financial review with the county manager um, and the finance director. We, uh, Brian has reported monthly during the financial report to the board of commissioners. Um, we delayed this year capital uh, purchases. Uh, we have been in discussion with ECVC uh, to determine um, how we can better recycle and get our uh, contamination issue under control and reduction in the recycling market. We did receive a grant from the state of North Carolina 
uh, that will go into effect July 1st. We're gonna receive $40,000. We're gonna implement an educational program where we're gonna change some of our recycling, what we're taking uh, and um, move forward with those. Um, we've met with the municipalities to discuss ECDC's uh, the issues um, and they're gonna follow our lead. It's gonna be our lead. Uh, we hired a financial staff member uh, at Solid Waste and he came on board about three months ago and has been uh, very helpful. Uh, I do now report to uh, Tim Corley, the county engineer, and he's also been very helpful. During the budget time, we spent a good three hours going through my budget um, line item, every line item, and we had a good discussion and it was very helpful. Uh, we have uh, reviewed our sorting line, um, our C and D, and we have reduced the number of hours we're operating that to save money. And we also uh, looked at our annual analysis of fees and rate modifications for this year. Budget drivers for this year. We have the um, cap repairs to the Southern unit. Uh, if you will, we uh, were hit with a compound um, one for dioxin that uh, we are needing to address. Um, and the cost, uh, we are working with uh, Wooten Company to come up with a, um, um, how we're gonna repair the cap at the landfill. Our estimated cost right now are uh, approximately $1.2 million to do the repairs. And there's a possibility that we may have to address the Northern unit as well that, uh, in the future. John, if, if I can interject, just for the board's benefit. So the Southwest Recycling operates the transfer station. Currently, all of our refuse is taken to Bertie County in the regional subtitle D land, line landfill in Bertie County. But prior to us having a contract with Bertie County in the regional landfill, we operated a landfill at the same location the transfer, locate, the transfer station is located. And there are basically two major cells of landfill cells in there. And the, the one cap that John is referring to is the cap that needs repair at this time. Just wanted to explain that differentiation. And, we, and we're required by the state to monitor the landfill and, and, and do repairs to it. We're, we're also required by the state to have a um, budgetary set aside, forget the exact terminology for that, but for um, cap repairs. Financial assurance. Financial assurance. And we do have a portion of that set aside for that cost, but not the, the entire cost because the cost to repair it exceeds what the state has required us to set aside in our fund balance of this enterprise fund. Also capital purchases, we did not purchase any capital last year. We do need to replace some equipment um, and, and um, containers um, estimated this year to be $935,000. Uh, repair and maintenance to the sites. We have a number of sites that we have major asphalt problems. The transfer station one, every time it rains, it's, it's in two curves where trucks are turning and it's nothing but gravel now. And if it rains, it gets really bad. And then we're constantly having to put rock back down and smooth it out. We really need to do the asphalt repair there. Um, ECVC's recycling tip and fee is going to increase and the projected additional cost for this upcoming year will be $390,000. John, just to illustrate the, 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 the true ton per ton cost on that, something like $35 per ton now going up to a hundred. Going up to a hundred dollars a ton yeah. in July. For ECVC to handle recyclable materials for all of Pitt County. Just wanted to, to note that that's a, a major driver in part of this, this area. Uh, disposal tipping fees. Uh, the private landfill in Bertie County is um, projected to, to increase as well as um, we're in negotiation with our uh, construction and demolition landfill EJE. They are projected. Um, they're asking for an increase in tipping fees as well and those additional costs could be up where in the $380,000 range. Uh, Tire disposal tipping fee increase is projected additional cost of $150,000. We are, uh, there's only really one player right now in the, that we can take our tires to. Um, looking at other avenues, 
um, to see what we can do. I've reached out to the state um, and the, um, because the state does um, provide us re uh, revenue back to take care of our dis tire disposal. Right now it's, it's very close to what it cost us. Um, some years it's a little less, some years we're okay. With this additional $150,000, I'm worried that the state's not gonna provide additional funding for our tires. Um, convenient site contracts, uh, as you know, we um, just um, uh, awarded new contracts for a year. That's gonna be an additional cost of $82,000 a year. And then our sale of shingles um, with the price of fuel going down, um, the price we get for shingles goes down as well because the company that buys them, Barnhill, uses the shingles to get the petroleum product out of it. So when petroleum prices are down, they're not going to want to pay as much. And we're going to lose about $50,000 in revenue um, there. John, let me just note, of all these budget drivers, really the only one that we really can influence directly would be the ECVC recycling. And in no way am I proposing or recommending this, but technically, if you did not recycle, then all of those goods would come to the transfer station then go to Bertie County. Um, we would not be paying ECVC the $100 per ton, nor whatever of the tonnage that comes back to us from ECVC that, that is um, contaminated. We then, then pay another tipping fee at Bertie Deal. County on that. I mean, theoretically, if, if we were to discontinue recycling just period, the cost savings on that would be how much, do you, Brian or John, do you remember? I don't know. Do you remember that, Tim? Was it 400, 500,000? Yeah, I think it's 800,000, I thought. We'd also have to factor in the in-kind services that we provide to them, um, including equipment and technical expertise. So it's probably closer to that larger number. Yeah, and, and keep in mind that uh, any material that's, uh, that is taken to the recycling center, we pay additional uh, for that material. So not only do we pay the $100 to ECVC for that material, but any contaminants within that material that um, needs to be taken to the trash, again, we pay our fee to Bertie County. So that trash that's being taken, in essence, really costs $135 per ton rather than the, just the $100. So, um, so, so we are actively working with the municipalities and with the carriers that bring us um, recyclable material. Uh, and we've got, we're, we're talking about a program possibly for this coming year where we actually reduce um, the actual numbers of recyclables that we actually accept because the markets are so bad on some of them that it's not worth uh, recycling those items. So we're working on that now with some of the uh, major players to come out with a campaign to actually just um, advertise which recyclable materials, four or five materials that will be asked to be recycled, um, as well as, um, you know, monitoring the amount of contamination to see if that helps. Um, we've let the municipalities and the carriers know that uh, we'll go through a period where we'll evaluate those contamination rates. And if the rates do not continue to drop or go down, if it's not successful, then we will evaluate uh, and possibly no longer do um, curbside pickup, recommend no, no curbside pickup, because that's where a lot of the contamination is coming from, is from the, the carriers um, that provide curbside service. So um, we're going to evaluate that as the year goes on, but there's still, as, as the manager mentioned, uh, just recycling in general. Um, you know, we certainly would like to continue recycling. We've been a leader in that, um, and but it is very costly uh, expense and going to go up significantly this year. Thank you. Solid Waste Enterprise Fund earnings and loss for the last um, three years, you can see, has has grown. Last year uh, was uh, at one point two million dollars. We're projected this year uh, of the loss of a uh, three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and and I think we're going to be very close to that. I'm I'm hoping that we're going to be a little bit better than that. Um, we with some of the items that some of the things that we've done throughout the year to save money. Um, on current and proposed tipping fees, um, we're looking, um, I'm asking that our commercial non-residential waste um, that's currently at $48 a ton increase to $50 a ton. Uh, construction and demolition waste uh, currently is at 43. I'm asking it to go to 45. Uh, clean concrete and block uh, 
is that we charge $10 a ton. I'm asking for a dollar per ton increase to 11. Uh, pallets and clean wood, it, we charge 25 per ton, asking it to go to 26. Um, shingles, asking it to clean shingles that we charge, that we can recycle. We charge $5 a ton and would ask for a dollar increase to $6. Also, the residential household fee is at currently at $6.17 per month. Um, my recommendation is to go to $10 per month, which is a $3.83 per month increase. And that is billed annually on the tax bill. Real quickly, what do you get for the household fee? Um, there's no charge for residential garbage uh, that is picked up by one of the municipalities or a private waste hauler, or you could take the material to the convenient sites. Um, anytime those trucks come across the scale, there's no tipping fee. Any residential waste, including furniture, junk, clothes, boxes, and material that is not construction and demolition debris, there is no charge whether you bring it to the landfill or the transfer station or one of the convenient sites. We don't charge for electronics and TVs. We don't charge anybody for recyclables and anybody in the county can use the convenient sites, whether you live in a municipality or, or not. Also, I left off yard waste is uh, we do not charge anybody for yard waste and um, yard waste um, is uh, we've seen an increase in that. I, I, I don't know how many trees there could be left in Pitt County, but it seems like we uh, everybody cutting them down. Surrounding counties, um, we put together this to uh, share with you what the surrounding counties are, uh, uh, their household fee, their tipping fee, whether they have convenient sites and whether they operate a landfill. Uh, as you can see, Beaufort County, their uh, monthly rate is 1333. Their commercial tipping fee is uh, $54. Industrial is 54. Their C and D rate is 4450. They, they charge for yard waste at 4450. They have 11 um, convenient sites and they operate a transfer station. Edgecombe County is at 833. Um, their commercial and industrial uh, tipping fee is $54. Their C and D is 4450. Their yard waste is 4450. They operate nine convenient sites. They operate a transfer station and a CND landfill. Green counties at um, $7 uh, per month. They charge uh, commercial and industrial at 46. Their CND is at $46 a ton. Their yard waste is $46 a ton. They have six convenient sites. They only have a CND landfill. So all the businesses have to to truck their waste to either Lenore County or Wilson County, and they have come to us on occasion. Johnston County um, is at 833 household fee a month. Um, they charge 37 for their commercial industrial waste. Their CND rate is $30 a ton. They charge $18 a ton yard waste. They have 12 convenient sites and their um, they're the closest around us that operate a MSW or a municipal solid waste landfill where the garbage goes to. Lenore County is at $750 uh, per month. Their commercial and industrial waste is $50 per ton. CND is at $45. Yard waste is at $30. They operate nine convenient sites and they operate a transfer station and a CND landfill. Martin County. Uh, Martin County charges $14.33. They um, have their commercial industrial uh, rate is $40 a ton. Their CND is at 40. Their yard waste is at 40. They do not have any convenient sites. Martin County has um, residential pickup for the whole county. Um, and they uh, operate a CND landfill. In Pitt County, our current rate is 617. Our commercial industrial is $48 per ton. Our CND rate is 43. We do not charge for yard waste and we operate 14 <clears throat> convenient sites and operate a transfer station. And I'll be glad to answer any questions anybody has.
Mr. Chairman, I, Tom Colson, I have questions. Okay, Mr. Colson. All right, uh, back on page two where you have your budget drivers, uh, you're talking about the asphalt that's breaking up. Asphalt's not very good in, in shear. Uh, it's like putty, it's stiff putty. Uh, if you're going to continue in that area, would it be cost effective to put concrete in there? Would it reinforce concrete that would be able to take that kind of load and stress and, and it might be costy, cost more initially but you won't have these continuous repairs afterwards. We've had that discussion and that's one of the things I was gonna to talk to Tim when we would go bid this out. I, I, I think it would be wise for us right at the curve to look right. at concrete. Yes, okay. sir. Okay, on the cap repairs, uh, this has come up a number of times. Uh, how long will we have to do cap repairs for, for a landfill? 200 years from now, will we still be having to, I, I, I know I'm being facetious with the numbers, but at some point, does it ever end or will we, could, is this a forever thing? It's, it's supposed to end in 30, 30 years. But, but and, how long has it been capped? I uh, believe the land that um, the Southern unit, to my knowledge, I think closed in 96. So in four years, we don't have to worry about capping it anymore? I would, or is that a legislator? I, I would, I would, that would be a, Okay. Yes, um, recycling. Um, what about incineration? I know that's talked about back in the 90s and it was rejected. But incineration, you don't have the long term disposal. Uh, what you have is ash. Yeah, ash may have heavy metals and other things in it, but you're going to have that in a landfill anyway. But it's, and it would be easier to get rid of the ash, it would seem to me. It, it's very expensive for incineration. I think incineration is the way of the future because you can produce energy. Um, we had a company about six months ago come to speak to us, uh, a British company, and it would cost um, to handle our garbage somewhere in a $25 million range. Mm -hmm. So it's the technology is there. It's just very expensive. Okay, on page three, you were talking about... Uh, Current and proposed fees, uh, we wanted to go to $10 a month. That generates $3.83 per month increase. But what's the total number? Uh, if you if that's approved, what what does that $3.83 actually generate total dollars? Throw a dart at the board. I, uh, I'm probably um, asking a question. You don't... Um, how much was it we figured? Yeah, I don't, I don't have that figure directly in front of me. I can get it to you. Okay. Yeah, we, we... All right, that's, that's fine. On the next page where it's got surrounding county fees and so on, where we have a yard waste and it's free. If we were to do $1, the reason I'm asking for $1 is because if it was 12 or 24 or 40 or something somewhere, I could take that $1 and multiply, equivalent and multiply it. So what would $1 generate in yard waste? 14 about fourteen thousand dollars. Fourteen thousand. We we get so, we roughly do fourteen to sixteen thousand. Okay. Well, let's call it fifteen thousand then. Yeah. So ten dollars would be one hundred fifty thousand, and forty dollars would be six hundred thousand. One issue of um, charging for yard waste would be the fact that you couldn't take it to the convenience sites because yeah, you have to go for have... scale. So all yard waste would have to come to the transfer station. Rather than right now, you can take it to any of the you 14 You can take your waste to the sites, and we have the facility in Aiden well, Griffin. And I'm, and I'm aware of that, but I was just wondering. For I, the I have looked at it a number of times, and um, I, um, I, have, I have some thoughts that I would like to bring back at some point, but I've. John, okay. John has been a proponent of charging for I, yard waste. I He's love been, to charge. He keeps trying to twist our arms on it, but. Well, there's a cost associated with it then you either pay for it yeah. or you pay for it indirectly. Yeah. And I'm one for paying for the services. My personal choice is just me. I'd rather pay for the services I use rather than be indirectly charged for things that I don't use. Yeah. And we, we've talked the same thing about the recycling piece, um, you know, breaking out a recycling fee from the, 
re regular yearly fee uh, on your tax bill. So um, that yard waste right now is just like the recycling fee. It's all in one um, package, which is that what we're suggesting that $10 a month fee. Um, so that includes all of those services. So. And John, I'd like to say that I've been to your landfill a number of times. The people there are very courteous. Uh, you run a good operation. I just wish you could get through the checkpoint a little faster. It really gets backed up at times. I, um, I, I put two people in the scale house a lot. And I honestly can say that for the past couple of months, I've been there every Saturday. Yeah. Well, little girl, everybody's little girl to me at my age. Uh, she was, last time I was there, she was back and forth, back and forth. I mean, she looked like a bumblebee. It can get She was busy. working hard. <laughs> anyway, thank you. That's all. Thank you. Before we go, can I um, address two points real quick? Uh, Commissioner Colson, the, the increase by the $3.83 from a budget standpoint, it's about $3.5 um, that was with the increase would generate an additional revenue for the solid waste fund. Um, okay. And then also in, in regards to tipping fees on the yard waste, um, when we looked at all of our tipping fees, we have to look at the amount of solid waste and, and yard waste that we receive on an annual basis and make the assumption that we're going to get that same amount of tonnage the next year. Um, so, um, as much as we would like to increase the just on the actual usage because you have an actual scale to compare the cost to versus a flat household fee, we still have to maintain that amount of solid waste to make that money. So for example, if, if for some odd reason our commercial or our industrial water decreased, then obviously we're not generating that revenue because um, that material is no longer going across the scale. So we have to find that fine projected amount and how that new the 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 new fee that john's proposing how those fees factor into the overall operations and then obviously the more you run across the scales the more you didn't have to send to Berkeley county and we have to go across their scales which also increases our cost so we we factored all with john tim and scott and i went back and forth probably six or seven times in the month of february when we put this budget together running the different scenarios and running the different numbers I would like to say that in our yard waste, um, we, we are selling majority of the mulch um, uh, to Cravenwood Energy. And um, so it's uh, at least we're able to get rid of it. A few years ago, it cost us, cost about $800,000 one year. Is mulch still free to yes, sir. Uh, individuals that yes, want to come out and pick it up? Yes, sir. Next. Mr. Okay. Chairman, we're to move on. We have Commissioner Ward. Okay, Commissioner Ward. Okay, thank you. Um, first, I wanted to comment on the ECDC recycling tipping fee increase from $35 to $100. And I did recognize and hear that we're going to try to um, downsize, for lack of a better word, the amount of that that we are doing, but that really seems like a big jump. And I, um, and, I, and I understand that with the recycling, that is, we're kind of at their mercy as far as uh, that is concerned. Um, the other thing is um, I wanted to thank you, Commissioner White, for uh, supporting maybe us hearing more about the EMS squads in the county uh, a report on that later on because we have some commissioners that have not been involved in some of the presentations in the past. So, and I feel like maybe we all need an update. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what do we have next, Mr. Scott? Mr. Chairman, you have Commissioner Floyd Huggins and then Commissioner Perkins Williams. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, um, John and uh, Tim. I, um, I'm i glad to hear that uh, we're going forward with the program uh, with the municipalities, and, and I know we've talked about, um, talked about that before, the recycling, uh, the contaminants.
uh, uh, in educating the uh, public. So I'm um, I'm glad to hear that we're going to move forward on on that. My other question, somewhat uh, what Beth said about the uh, the ECVC, and I mean the the cost of that. I want to ask why um, you just increase. Uh, I think it was uh, commercial, like uh, a dollar, and a, a, another one a dollar. Uh, versus the household, I think, what was that, $3 or something like that? I, I didn't write all of them down. But I was wa I'm was wondering if you could increase the commercial and the other one uh, uh, maybe to $2 or, or $3 there. Okay. So, uh, Commissioner Floyd Huggins, um, if I can jump in and answer that question. Um, again, we went through various scenarios of expected tonnage and what that would generate and then what that particular um, fee would need to be to, to keep us in ballpark. What we can do, uh, if, if you so direct us, is we can go back to that analysis and, uh, and look at what, instead of a $2 increase, what a $3 increase on certain fees would look like and we could bring that back to you tomorrow if, if you so choose. And part of that rationale too was, as we looked at on the page four of the PowerPoint, as you look at our surrounding counties, we're trying to make our fees in line to a degree with like jurisdictions. But if you'd like them to be um, different, that's not an issue either. Well, it, it, yes, I look, tried to remember, as I said, I didn't write it now, but I think I saw that we were lower than some of the surrounding areas in, in some of those uh, categories. So yes, let's look at uh, if we can increase that and what it would uh, what it would would give us. Commissioner, one of the, one of the other things that we did, um, we actually looked at each operation of the solid waste and recycling uh, department as well to, to try to determine what the true costs were of each operation. And one of the reasons. Uh, we did it like we did is because we we kind of analyzed what was coming in and what the expenditures were for each of those operations and which ones you know if, if we go up just a dollar on um, say a, a tipping fee charge um, that did not produce enough revenue to offset the actual true cost of what it was costing us to get rid of the larger um, solid waste piece so that's why most of those fees were adjusted toward the uh, Toward the, toward the uh, yearly fee rather than the tipping fee piece. But we can certainly look at that and, and see if there's any uh, changing of that we can adjust or need okay, to. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. next to Commissioner Perkins Williams and then Commissioner Albright. Commissioner Perkins Williams. Um, thank you, Mr. Demery, for what you do. And um, I'm, I'm, I want to say that whatever happens from the activity that you produce, we have a, a trash problem in all districts of this county. And I certainly would want people to be encouraged to pick up that trash or to keep their trash with them until they can dispose of it appropriately. Um, as we seek development and we don't look like we care about our communities, uh, that's not encouragement for development. I still say most developers won't, don't wanna invest their dollars and cents into a trash dump when they're trying to build a very fine uh, building. So if we, the household trash going up, we already have problem with the heck trash all along the highway, even the small trash bags and, and the furniture mattresses and that sort of thing. And people just take it to areas where you don't see a home and they're just dumping it along the highway. I don't know how we're gonna discourage that if we are raising the, um, price 
for it. I don't know how you balance that. I'm not into balancing that. I just like for us to have a good place to deposit in the convenient site. And um, there's a lot of people using it when I go to it. So uh, I like to keep that available or that resource in its place so that people will, will consider whenever they're making a run past one, uh, uh, past a convenient site, they will deposit their trash without hesitation. Uh, so what it, that's what concerns me because we're not growing over here, but we have a lot of trash along the highway. And if the citizens are now conscious of it and they're doing more to it, I would like to see us, Commissioner, at least keep them encouraged on that and then maybe think about something else uh, because it is important to not have that trash. When people come here and look at Pitt County for development, that's gonna send a message. If it's run down, destroyed, ugly, a nuisance as in disability. So that's, that's what concerns me. We, we want development over here. We want a good quality of life and we want to be inclusive into the final things that Pitt County has to offer. So whatever you do, Mr. Jemery, uh, keep that in mind, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Albright. Thank you, and for your uh, operation and for the presentation. I think this is a math question for uh, Brian. Um, I'm, if you could help me understand the requested residential household waste fee increase, if we were looking at say that hundred thousand dollar house, and this were uh, an increase in our uh, ad valorem, what would the percentage? What would that uh, be? If I if I'm making myself clear with my question. I, I follow your question. Um, you, you just put me on the spot and trying to do the math in my head. Well, yeah, I, I'm moving decimals around and I'm just really bad at it. So, um, and you can come back with that later. I don't need to put you on the spot. I'm sorry, but I would like to know that at some point. Okay. We'll bring that back to you, Commissioner Albright. Thank you. We'll report that tomorrow morning. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, that's all the hands we have raised, unless there's any other commissioner who'd like to pose a question or make a comment. Well, uh, I, I, I wanted to just say uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm serving on the ECVC board and this recycling as all of the commissioners, have, have, most of them have voiced is a very major problem. And, and I guess my concern is that uh, we've gone down to $390,000, I think, in terms of uh, money that we are paying out for recycling. What is that comparing to two years ago, Brian? What were we paying for recycling? And so that this kind of bring it into some perspective as to where we are now compared to about two years ago. Yeah, um, uh, Chairman McLawhorn, I think the 390,000 that you're referencing to is the actual increased cost for ECVC going into next year. Um, that's another one of those numbers. If you give us some time that we can put together for tomorrow morning, and show you what those costs look like two years and even last year and where we are today. And we can have those um, prepared for you. John I, might be able to on the spot. I, tell us I what can the give you a tonnage. Yes. A couple of years ago, we were paying $25 a ton. Um, since I've been here, we, we, we started out at zero, then it went to about 17 and then it went back to zero. Then it went to 25 and it's, increase since then but a couple of years ago it was $25 a ton. John you've been here how long? Um, I've been here 12 and a half years okay. uh, and also I, I probably should have mentioned this um, the $100 a ton that ECVC is charging it's getting it's that way statewide getting that way statewide and, and, and nationally the cost of recycling is increasing. Okay. Yeah, I think it would be good to bring that back to us, uh, Brian, so that we can. Uh, it's Tom Colson, I, I'd like to make a statement if I could. Okay. Uh, ACVC provides jobs to people that 
can't find jobs anywhere else. And we as a county, in my opinion, need to do everything we can to help ECVC become a success. And going back to the question, if I understand uh, Commissioner Albright's question, if we went to $10, that would be one cent per hundred on the hundred, if you had a $100,000 house. That's all. Okay. Oh, very good. Uh, I want to thank you uh, for that presentation, uh, Mr. Denver. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Manager. Mr. Chairman, at this point in time, the agenda has discussion questions and directives. Um, if there's any, tomorrow being the last scheduled workshop day, if there's anything additional use the board would like us to compile or numbers you'd like us to crunch to bring in tomorrow's workshop. Not to say that we can't bring in additional information um, if you want to meet next week or possibly even bring it back on the 15th, but I would just like to provide the board that opportunity to pose any questions or directives or, or discussion otherwise. I think basically you heard some of the concerns um, uh, that, that was voiced uh, by the board members and, and it seems to me that Brian said he will uh, try to get some figures up that uh, we can uh, listen to on, on tomorrow. Mr. Chairman, we do have um, two hands up by first by Commissioner Fitzpatrick and then by Commissioner Ward. Okay, Commissioner Fitzpatrick first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at, at this time, it's not specifically to the budget, um, but what I would like to do is make a motion uh, to suspend the implementation of the mask requirements for the county employees. Um, and that is based on uh, employee feedback and the unlikelihood of municipalities um, complying with our directive. Uh, I have reached out and talked to representatives from the city of Greenville. Um, and as my understanding, they will not be um, implementing such a policy. Uh, that also leads me to believe that um, because they will not be implementing that policy that the other, you know, the other municipalities uh, will probably join suit. Um, and that basically what we would be doing is, uh, I think the employees see this as, as a punishment at this point. Um, certainly we want everyone to be safe, but I, I trust the, um, the employee's discretion and use of common sense. If they feel that they need to wear a mask, then they should be allowed to do so. Uh, but my vote or my motion would be to suspend the implementation of the mask policy. Chairman, I'd like to second that motion. And I'd like to add that uh, at the current rate of infection over the last six weeks, if you run the numbers, is you would have to live for 165 years for all the citizens in Pitt County to have the opportunity or a chance to catch COVID-19 once. Think of that. Once in 165 years at the current rate of infection. Now that's not to say that the COVID-19 is not dangerous, but I believe that we should be able to practice uh, wearing a mask when we need to. You notice I'm not, I happen to have a thing here that says, do, do your part and maintain social distancing. So, okay, I'm doing the social distancing. And I think the employees, they need to be able to do the social distancing too. And on top of that, I have not seen a procedure. I understand one has been written. It's not come by me. I believe that that procedure needs to go before the full board before it would actually be uh, approved because we county commissioners might want to amend it or adopt it as is. Mr. Chairman, if I can, if I can um, make a comment regarding the, the procedure at your meeting on Monday the 1st, um, it was my interpretation that the board asked me to put into place an administrative procedure for the workforce requiring the, the masking. And we did prepare a, a simple procedure and it was emailed out to the employees yesterday. And if you'd like me, I could, I could read it. It's just a simple, yes. like one paragraph um, document. Please proceed. All right, so it's entitled Temporary Policy to, Due to COVID-19 Wearing of Face Coverings. Adopted June 1st, 2020, effective date June 3rd today, Wednesday the 3rd. The purpose is 
to reduce the asymptomatic spread of COVID-19 virus among county employees. Policy reads as follows. In order, to, in order to reduce the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, all Pitt County government employees, then in parentheses, it says full or part-time, permanent or temporary, and all contractors working in Pitt County government facilities are required to wear a face covering when interacting with other people. This requirement applies to indoor, comma, in-person interaction with other people, including coworkers, contractors, and members of the public. A face covering is material that covers the nose and mouth. It can be secured to the head with ties or straps or simply wrapped around the lower face. It can be made of a variety of materials, although no material may be worn that contains offensive language or pictures. If the employee does not have his or her own face mask, one will be provided by the county, which we've already done that previously and we offered again yesterday. Reasonable accommodations will be made for those who, due to disability, are unable, unable to comply with this policy. And when we say this policy is effective immediately, being today, the June the 3rd, and shall end on December 31st, 31st 2020, unless terminated sooner or extended by the Board of County Commissioners. Well, I'd like to also add that the World Health Organization is now saying that healthy people should not be wearing masks. They've done a, an about face. And the reason they did it is, is, is there's a whole lot of reasons why they did it. But if we're going to listen to them, and, and that, that's been part of the, you know, initially they, they panicked. And that's, what, that's really what we're seeing now. We're seeing a panic. It's not a pandemic. It's a panic. I know people that won't even see their grandchildren because they're, they're so afraid. The media has driven this to, to the point to where people are just scared to death. Thank you. Do you have any? I know there's a motion on the floor in a second. But do we have any other discussion uh, at this time? Commissioner, is that Commissioner Nunley? Uh, and I see Commissioner Floyd, Floyd Huggins, and. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, we've lost Commissioner White. Could we take a maybe a five minute recess and get her back on the line? And then we do have a number of hands up Commissioner Ward, Perkins Williams, Commissioner Nunley, and, and Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Okay, very good. Well, why don't we take a five minutes break then we'll come back to this. Thank you.
Is that Commissioner White that just jumped back in? Hey, this is. I am so sorry for all that confusion and everything. Um, my phone disconnected, okay. and then I, when I tried to call back, it just would not let me in until Carla called me and, and automatically started working again. So anyway. No problem. We got you in. We're gonna. I'm just gonna put you back on mute and um, relabel it, and we'll let everybody know um, and get restarted momentarily. All right. Thank you so much.
All right, everyone, we are going to come back in about 30 seconds. We have Commissioner White back on. We are going to uh, open uh, to Scott, who will then uh, throw it to uh, you, Chairman McLawhorn. Very good. Uh, so everybody stand by in a 30 seconds. The Pitt County Board of Commissioners are back after a brief recess. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, we'll turn the meeting back over to you. Yes, very good. Um, uh, roll call, Mr. Chairman, if you're agreeable. Uh, yes, roll call, please. Madam Clerk. Madam Clerk. Not present. Can you hear us, Chairman McLawhorn? Yes. Yeah. I hear you. Um, we're going to do roll call. Chairman McLawhorn. Oh uh, yes, here. Can you hear me? Yes. Vice Chair Colson. Commissioner Albright. Here. Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Here. Commissioner Floyd Huggins. Here. Commissioner Nunnally. Here. Commissioner Perkins Williams. Here. Commissioner Ward. Here. Commissioner White. Here. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Um, so we've taken a brief recess. We got Commissioner White back on the line. And um, the you had a motion on the floor to suspend employee face mask requirements by Commissioner Pat Fitzpatrick and um, second by Commissioner uh, by Vice Chairman Colson. And you have a number of hands up. You have Commissioner Ward, Perkins Williams, Nunley. Commissioner Floyd Huggins and Commissioner White. Okay. Uh, all right, Commissioner Nunley. Commissioner Nunley, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will just again reference my comments yesterday and the overwhelming evidence that um, how prudent and cost effective and um and and actually medically effective the wearing of face masks has been proven um in particular in indoor environments um and and i, I frankly i'm really severely disappointed at, at some of the members of our commission that continue to spread um you know factual inaccuracies about the actual scientific research behind the wearing of face coverings where we should be doing everything we can do to make sure our businesses and our business people that are working hard to get back up on their feet um, that, have, that have really struggled um, throughout this crisis and the people that have suffered severe health consequences as a result of this crisis need to be doing everything in our power to make sure that we can get back up and keep working. And, and, and frankly, it's, it's, it's extremely disappointing and that we continue to hear um, from members of this commission um, just, just factual inaccuracies. Um, and I'm, I don't need to read the, the, the hundreds of, of scientists and the, and the papers. And we hear this World Health Organization thing thrown out, which is, which is thrown out often by, um, uh, but their guidance has to do with medical face coverings. Um, and medical face coverings are N95 masks. And that's not what we're talking about here. Um, so again, we have this continued um, and again, it's, it's thankfully a shrinking population of people that continue to spread these falsehoods. 
Um, but I call on our commission to stand strong and, and to really work with our business community to get us into a place where in the fall and winter, um, where we can continue to keep our economy open and keep our people in work and keep our people safe while we do it. Uh, COVID-19 is not finished. Um, our health director said that. Mike Waldron, the chief of Binet that serves Eastern North Carolina, has said that. Um, Nobel Peace Laureates have said it. Um, leading economists, leading, leading medical researchers. Look, the, look the, 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 we, we've got to stop and get on board with this together. This is, not, this is not a police state action. You wear a shirt when you go into a business. Um, we're asking temporarily, if you're an employee, that, that you do what's best for your fellow person. Um, and, 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 and look, it's a hard move. Um, culturally, we're not there in, in this country, and it's a big ask. Um, but if we look at the cost and we look at the benefits and you really read the science, I mean, really read it, um, it's undeniable. So, so I just, we just got to stop with this spreading of falsehoods, though, and, and this continue this inappropriate signaling when, when leadership on both sides of the aisle in this country have come around to, to, to accepting the, 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 the science on this. So I, I call for, um, for our commission to, to stand up, um, do the right thing, wear masks when we're around other people, and then continue to strongly encourage our public to do so. Um, we, we've got to model the correct behavior here. Um, and, and I hope that, that, that our commission will continue to do so. And I thank our staff. And, and look, I understand that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big change and it's, it's, it's different. Um, but we're not asking you to wear a mask when you're in your car by yourself or in your office by yourself. We're just asking you to wear a mask on the off chance that maybe you're infected and you don't know it um, so that you don't infect someone that you're talking to. It's just a, it's just a courteous thing to do. Um, so, so I'll leave my comments at that strongly opposed to the commissioner Fitzpatrick's motion. Um, and, and I, and I, and I just support that we continue uh, with this policy and, and, um, and see how things grow over the next few weeks and continue to advocate strongly that our public um, wear, wear masks when they're in public as well. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ward. Um, I, I just want to reiterate and support the uh, decision that we made. Um, I, I was glad to hear from Scott uh, what was put out to the county employees. I don't know what response they have gotten, but I feel like our county uh, employees are, are trying to implement exactly what was just stated. Uh, we do not expect any more. And I would like to say also that I hope our citizens are doing the same thing. When I have been into restaurants to pick up a takeout or they have been in stores, most all of them have been in compliance with the mask. So I really think our citizens are stepping up and I certainly do not want us to encourage them to go in a different way. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner White. Um, yes, I'm, yes uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I want to, I have a couple of comments. One, um, I want to remind everybody on this board, we are public servants. We are not dictators or kings. I would also like to remind everybody on this board that when um, myself and a few other commissioners have brought up resolutions for local control, the response was we need a unified statewide approach and um, Right now, there is no unified statewide approach to mandate people wearing masks. There's recommendations, but the governor has not called for mandates. Um, recommendations are one thing, but mandates are something completely different. And I have had dozens, literally dozens, of county employees reach out to me upset over this. Some of them have health conditions that they don't feel like that they can wear masks. There's been some who said that their doctors have told them that for their own health that they did not need to wear a mask. Um, I would urge you all 
to please reconsider your votes yesterday um, because this this is just not the right thing to do. Um, the again, the public health director has used the word recommend and guidelines, and I think that we need to be following our own public health director. Um, Dr. Silvernail is our public health director. I think that we need to be taking advice from him, and he has not, to my knowledge, recommended mandating employees wear face masks. Um, so, again, I would just urge you all to please reconsider the mandate and requirement on face masks. Okay. Commissioner Huggins? Commissioner Huggins. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I support uh, Mr. Nunley, Commissioner Nunley, uh, uh, motion yesterday. I still support it today. I support his comments today. And one thing I want to say is that uh, we don't know when we are carriers. That's 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 important to me. We don't know. Nobody knows when when they are a carrier. So you wear the mask to protect uh, other people. Uh, and I will continue to encourage uh, our county employees. I will continue to encourage our citizens to wear face masks when they. Uh, when they are out, and especially when they cannot practice social distancing. So I am in total support of, of our um, vote yesterday, uh, today. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my questions are directed to our manager, Scott Elliott. Mr. Yes, Elliott. Yes, ma'am. Um, how many employ, uh, is it, is it your, is it your job as the county manager to manage the county? Yes, ma'am. And you get, and you get, receive our, um, directive as a board in whole. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. I would like to know from you, how many people who work for the county of Pitt who complained to you about wearing a mask? Um, I had one employee directly complain to me. Okay, he, Mr. He, he, Manager, I thank you for your honesty. Uh, it is not the, it, from all of the training that I've gone to as a board, and I want you, my fellow colleagues to know that I go to those meetings because when I came to the board, I had ideas about what is uh, the task of a commissioner as a part of a board. But I go to those meetings to gain insight and learn specifically what we're supposed to do. And uh, from all of my training, this is what I know. What I want to say to my colleagues from all of that training, you will find out that Mr. Elliott has the task of managing the county. Uh, he has only received one. I listen to residents, I talk with them, I get an idea as to how they may feel. I haven't had anyone, I had no, I've had one leader to say that he did not want to wear a mask, although he, uh, serves in a church that uh, is still having services outside in the parking lot. I want you to know that my, um, I am concerned that we don't follow our own policies as a board. And if we're going to manage this county with um, a balanced sequence, and if we are going to instruct our county manager in the proper way, we need to start following the rules. Um, 
unfortunately, when we vote on something and we bring it back, and I have a, a lot of respect for um, Commissioner Cosum. He has been a genuine, in my turn, uh, mentor. He shared some of his ideas as a county commissioner for a number of years. But I have noticed over time, we don't follow our own rules and it's getting us into trouble. Now about the mask, my, I'm voting with the people that I know have problems with health. I'm voting with the people who don't have the opportunity to speak up for themselves. I'm voting with the people who suffer because respiratory problems are really life-threatening for many of us. I had shortly many family members to die from the matter. My sister died as a result of asthma. My aunt, my father's sister died as a result of asthma. My sister that my aunt that had what had two children to die from asthma. I want to say to you, um, my direct family members to track asthma and had to have machines. I want to say to you on my children, my personal, the children that I bore is in, in weird. Their father has serious problems with heart. Those are the people that I concern. These are not people in my district, mind you. These are people in those districts who bring them up. And I say to this board on a number of occasions, I think first about human life. I'm sorry, that's the way I was born up. And then I, I was reared and I'm proud that my parents say that you don't judge a people by what they look like. You judge the people who treat you and consider your heartfelt. It is not my job to manage the county. And I appreciate all of the county employees who respect me as a board member and answer my questions and respond to me openly and honestly, because all of us don't know everything about everything. I am so sorry that human life doesn't mean as much to you as it does me. And I, I do respect uh, Mr. Cosins as one of the leaders of this board as well as Mrs. Uh, 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 Ward, who's been there a long time, and Melvin, who's been there a long time. But I like learning things for myself. This is why I asked the county manager, what was his duty? And then I know that every one of the county employees has specific duties that they are to perform. And I respect that. You know, and I am reluctant to say a lot within, within me. Every now and then I do it. And this course that I'm taking is helping me be positive about what I'm being. So, Mr. Manager has a job to do and he only heard one. And I would like to say to the county employees who are under the management of our county manager, and I think we pay him well to do that. If you have a real problem about doing what we pass, then you should let the county manager know. If you have a health issue that you have and you don't want to do it, then let the county manager know. Because when I walk in a store and people don't want to follow the thing as a whole and they walk up on me, they are threatening my life. 
when they walk up on someone who has asthma and mind you, we all don't have equal opportunity. So I'm doing the best I can for what we have to deal with. I am going to vote against the motion, Mr. Fitzpatrick, because there are other things too that we're faced with. And I'm quite sure I have shared them with the manager. And I'm quite sure I have shared them with the attorney. Black people are facing things that you don't have to face. And I want us to remain peaceful. I want us, as I say to my district all the time in private, and I won't use the words I say to them, but I say to them, they think that they can understand that look, when you talk with the county employees, I want you to talk with dignity, respect, and be responsible for what you say. Because I'm asking you to relay your concern to them, but I want you to respect them. I respect the people we hire and I appreciate their open honesty. I have not shared with manager Elliot anything about anybody disrespecting me and I can come off the chain too, but they've never disrespected me. And today I wanna to thank every one of you that who've come in contact and I've just started uh, coming in contact with Mr. Demery. But then I send him a private comment Sometimes, I, I, most of the time, I try to do it in the habit of, of, of a clear CC to the county manager to let him know. But if everybody don't talk to the people in charge of whatever it is they need to talk to, um, then it's necessary. And Mr. Fitzpatrick, I hope. I'm doing your name right. You know one of the things that I'm talking about. But as we met yesterday, I received phone calls from the public. And um, I thank all of the people who sent me emails. I did take it in considerations. But there are other factors involved here. And when I research with medical people, A pandemic is serious. And if we had an outbreak, we don't have beds to put them in. We have no vaccine to help them fight with from their bodies. And the more dies, the less tax dollars we receive. So I am with all of the positive things as it relates to pandemic and communicable diseases, spreads. I hope we can learn to feel other people's pains. And when people walk up on me, I, occasionally I've said something, but for the most part, I put my stuff down and go somewhere where the store is not as crowded. Because even though my personal body may not have it, I don't want my children to get it, nor the ex, nor my neighbor down the street, nor the neighbor who grew up with me to have to be confronted with communicable diseases. Thank you, Mr. Brian Barnett, County Manager Scott Elliott, and Ms. Janice Gallagher. I see your mask and I see, I don't know who it is, I can't see on the side, but I'm making it short now and I'm ending. I just want you to know, I've, I've shared some things with you, Mr. Cosum, and um, I appreciate what you try to do. But if the residents of Pitt County would at least put on a mask when they're out in public, I could vote with you. But I think people are important. Thank you. That's all I want to say. 
Thank and you. I do value, I do value development. Ever since I've been on this board, I've fought for development. I've not been placed to impact it, but I want development because the people over here need it. But as long as you walk around without a mask, I don't know your conditions. So I put one on, but I know my children's position. And when you are born with a low immunity, you catch everything. Thank you. I'm finished. Thank you uh, very much. Um, I want to just say, Commissioner Nunley, I, I certainly appreciate uh, your foresight and your insight in, in, in this for the safety and well-being of all the citizens here in Pitt County. I too believe that wearing a mask is to protect others. And your statement on that is well taken. Uh, Mr. Manager, I think now at this point, uh, we, have, we, we, have, we have a vote in a second on this. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you have a few more people who'd like to speak. You got Commissioner Fitzpatrick, Commissioner um, White, and Commissioner Albright, okay. I believe. And Ward. Yeah. And Ward. All right, so Commissioner Fitzpatrick and Commissioner, okay. Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make clear, nobody is saying that we should not recommend that Pitt County employees or Pitt County citizens not wear the mask. That's not what we're saying. The problem is the mandate for the Pitt County employees. And the reality of the situation is the city of Greenville is not going to implement a similar plan. So what we're going to do if we fast forward to the next meeting and the commission decides to um, implement the plan countywide, we're going to have a disconnected and disjointed plan that's going to apply for county areas and not in the cities. I mean, to me, that makes no sense. That's the problem that I have. I certainly want everyone to be as safe as possible, but mandating one small group of the population is not going to be effective. It's essentially, and, and from the employees that I've talked to, is looked at as a punishment. No one is saying that they shouldn't be encouraged to wear a mask. In fact, I think our message should be that all citizens should be encouraged to wear a mask. The problem is the issuance of the mandate for the county employees now knowing, and this has been confirmed, I personally confirmed it, that the city is not going to require it. So that's the problem that I have. It's nothing to do with the safety of other people. Certainly I want people to be as safe as possible. But the reality of the situation is this is not going to be realistic. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ward. Um, Mr. Chairman, I know you have other people to speak, but um, since this is a budget workshop and we have spoken on this issue before, and we have heard that we've had one person who had a concern. Um, anyway, I would like to make a motion and um, reiterate the, the um, support for continuing with the motion that we made in past at our last meeting. Need to be a substitute motion. That would be a second. We already have a motion in the floor. Yes. We already have a motion in the second on the floor. Oh, okay. Um, well, then maybe I should. Can I ask for that vote to be taken in right now? That's what I would like to do. Well, we have other people wanting to make comments. It, it seems to me, and I'm one of those. I, I want to jump back in there. And, and say okay, something. well, let me make a substitute motion. My substitute motion is that we continue with the plan that we voted on. Um, I have not heard complaints. We heard from the manager that we've heard from one person. Yes, there may be somebody out there who doesn't want to do that, but I don't think we're requiring people to put on masks when they get up in the morning and take them off when they go to bed at night. We're asking them when they're within 
within 10 feet of people, I mean, when they're close to people or in a meeting or that they should wear a mask. And, um, and I think the county employees setting an example is a very positive thing. And I did say that I think it's important that the citizens in this county know that we as commissioners are also recommending that for them to do the same safety. Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you. And do we have a second on that motion? Uh, do we have any hands up, Scott? Um, well, I mean, hands up from the prior asking to speak. For the second, I think it was Floyd Huggins. Okay. Commission, right. Floyd, Commission Floyd Huggins. Second. Uh, Commission Floyd Huggins has seconded. Okay. Thank you very much. I thank all other. Do we have anybody else need to speak on this? Uh, yes, yes. I want to thank some several names. Um, I don't know if Mary Perkins Williams has spoken, didn't want to speak again, but uh, Commissioner White, Ward, and then Colson. Okay, go on. Commissioner White. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I want to say about Scott just getting the one complaint, you all need to put yourselves in the shoes of these employees. I mean, a lot of them are not going to go to their boss and complain about a rule. I mean, they're going to go talk to somebody confidentially about it. A lot of people might not want to disclose that they have health issues. Um, they're not going to want to cause problems for themselves at work. So I feel like if it wasn't for that, then we would probably have a lot more complaints to the county manager and other department heads among the county. But like I said, I mean, they are trying to not cause problems for themselves at work. So they're going to come talk to somebody confidentially. Um, I actually sent Scott an email last night or early this morning about the dozens and dozens of um, concerns that I've had from um, employees of the county and I have also spoken with other municipal leaders myself since Monday um, Greenville included in that I know um, Commissioner Fitzpatrick said he's spoken to some leaders in Greenville and I've also spoken to some leaders in some other municipalities and they are not going to implement this so again I want to say that this will just be the county implementing this it will not be the municipalities either or at least not a majority of them um and that's all i have to say thank you okay thank you i, th I thank commissioner colson commissioner uh, perkin Whitney has already spoken on this um, I have more to say. you have you have another statement to make commissioner? new motion on the floor and i have more to say Commissioner Colson. What we're about to do here is we're effectively saying that the employees of Pitt County do not have the ability to make a common sense choice that they could wear a mask or not wear a mask. And the way the policy is written, I got it in front of me. Uh, the word right now says required. Uh, the question is, should required be changed to encouraged? because there are times when it would seem to me that social distancing, that's also one of the, the pra best practices that have been put forward, would be a better option than wearing a mask eight hours a day. None of us commissioners are gonna be voting for this, are gonna to have to wear a mask for eight hours a day. And so I really think that the wording of this should be stated in such a way that we commissioners have input into it that allows for the fact that, that, our, that our employees are not stupid. They can make decisions for themselves that are best practices. They don't wanna get sick either, but they don't wanna be smothered by a mask. I'll, I'll mention my wife. She's got a doctor's letter from a pulmonologist that says that she can't wear a mask because if she does, it will cut her oxygen down into the 70 percentile range which is dangerous. And so she, she can't wear a mask. What is she supposed to do? Stay indoors all the time? Uh, 
I, I believe that the policy needs our input. I think every commissioner should get it. And before it goes into final effect, we, we the board of commissioners, examine the wording and have, con otherwise, what are we doing? We commissioners are passing on our authority and responsibility. We're, we're literally abdicating it to the county manager, one person to make a policy, but I'm not picking on you, Scott. You, you're doing what you're supposed to, and I understand that. So I'm not trying to put you down, but we're abdicating our responsibility to a policy writer, and we have no input to the actual wording. I think something as serious as this needs the full body of commissioners to examine that wording and come back with it. And after uh, we discuss it and do whatever we got to do to make, uh, make it a more reasonable policy than what I'm seeing in front of me. The county health director is, as of Tuesday coming, is going to be having his re-entry policy. He has said on TV a couple of times that he would not feel unsafe to go to a restaurant today. He has said that there are times to wear a mask and times when he doesn't think that we should wear a mask. Now this is a doctor and he's our public health director. So let, I think we need to see what his reentry policy is or direction. I'm gonna, not gonna say policy, but direction. I'll bet you he's not gonna tell everybody they have to wear a mask for eight hours a day or 24 hours a day. Because if we really truly wanna be self safe, why don't we carry it to the extreme and we, everybody, 185,000 people in Pitt County have gotta wear a mask 24 hours a day. Does that make sense? Well, no, that doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense to say to our county employees that are gonna be sitting in an office and they're not gonna be around anybody that they have to wear a mask, but yet somebody walks into their area or into their office, all of a sudden they gotta pull out their mask and slam it onto their face. Why can't we just say, practice the social distancing? There are times when you might need to wear a mask, but let's say instead of a required, let's say encouraged. And, and also the policy I think needs to put in there social distancing and use words like where reasonable. I guess that's all for now, but there may be more. Thank you very much. I think that now we've had everyone to talk uh, to express themselves. Uh, Scott, I do want to just bring up one point. I would think that if a person have any medical uh, concerns and, and, and is from their doctor or from the physician uh, saying that they cannot wear a mask because of a, a medical reason, that this would, pro this would be taken into consideration. Could you speak on that? Yes, and as yeah. I read to the, before the board earlier, the full policy the sentence says reasonable accommodations will, will be made for those who comma due to a disability comma are unable to comply with this policy. We would ask them to provide a doctor's note if this policy is upheld in, for, in that, that case. Does that not violate HIPAA requirements? It would seem to me they don't have to disclose their health issues to you. So it would not um, violate the HIPAA requirements. If I could just say two things. If you could hear me, I'm just going to pull my mask down so that I'm uh, more understandable. Um, just two things. One, the policy does provide an exception like we do for any reasonable accommodation that needs to be made for any employee at any time. And this would be inclusive within that. We would keep any information absolutely confidential like we do in any other accommodation requests. The other thing, if, if I may, Chairman, in addition to providing that exception is shared because I know other county employees um, take interest and watch our meetings and I would be remiss if I didn't say um, that yesterday um, I did receive two written complaints and approximately nine um, verbal complaints from employees about the policy so I just wanted to share for those employees who are watching that I didn't sit silently and not express those concerns and I think they came to me as a member of management team to express those complaints. So answer to your question is, I don't believe we're violating HIPAA. I don't believe we're violating the Americans with Disabilities Act because we will provide reasonable accommodations. Um, but I think there have been uh, a, a good number of rumbling, rumblings of discontent. Thank you very much. I think that we've now are ready to vote. 
Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, how would we proceed in this? Um, you would vote on the substitute motion first, which is to continue with the original motion of re requiring face coverings. Very good. Okay. Chairman McLawhorn? Yes. Vice Chair Colson? No. Commissioner Albright? Yes. Commissioner Fitzpatrick? No. Commissioner Floyd Huggins? Yes. Commissioner Nunnally? Yes. Commissioner Perkins Williams? I had a question on the, um, in the previous discussion was this new, new information. Uh, you know, we have a department that has to serve the public and about half of that department within uh, social services, because I serve on that board. You never ask about the board that much, but Mrs. Elliott did promise uh, to talk about the, uh, someone in the public brought the virus to the office and the staff that we need to serve the population of Pitt County had to go home and quarantine. I, I, and I'm making sure I say it so that it's not HIPAA violation. But when you serve the public and someone bring it in during a pandemic, you have to follow the rule of uh, non-spread. And that is to go home and quarantine for 14 days, which means that that department became stressed because half of it was out. That, that too is in consideration. And I like to say to the employees, uh, I thank you, Mrs. Gallagher, for making your comment because you do supervise in that employee. But had you shared it with uh, Scott Elliott, he would have had a better accounting. Uh, there is a hierarchy in place in every organization. And I worked at ECU for a number of years and I know how people talk. And I know they pick on one that they feel that the subject can be accepted of. So that's what I want you to know. My vote is yes. Commissioner Ward. Commissioner Ward. Yes. Commissioner White. Yes. Commissioner White. I'm not, I'm muted. I, we hear you. Is it safe to say Commissioner White? I'm muted. She would be no. We, we heard you Commissioner Ward. We have your vote. We're waiting for Commissioner White. To clarify. Okay. Okay, to clarify, yes, um, to clarify, this is voting to uphold the mandate that was passed yesterday, right? Monday. The board's That's action Monday. Ago. Yes. Correct. Hello? Yes, that, that is correct. The board's action Monday. It is to continue the action or the plan, the original motion for okay. Monday. Okay, um, my vote then is no. Motion passes six to three. Very, very good, thank you very much. Uh, so we, based upon that, we would not need to go to the, the, the original motion, is that correct? Correct. correct. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, do we have any more discussion and comments or questions at this time from the commissioners? Okay, I hear none. Um, um, actually, we have two hands up, Commissioner Nunley and Commissioner Perkins-Williams. Commissioner Nunley. Thank you, Chairman Warren. Um, and, and seeing as how this is a budget workshop and we're discussing expenses for um, the next fiscal year, I uh, do think it's appropriate in light of um, recent events and, and just historically um, that we, that I, I would, I, based on some constituent concerns and what I've been approached about over the last uh, number of days, um, I would like to ask county staff to 
uh, run an estimate of what it would what it would cost our county to um, safely and um, civilly remove the Confederate memorial um, at the county courthouse. I would, um, if the county attorney is able this morning, do you have your file maybe just to inform the board what legally we can and cannot do regarding that monument? And this is just, this is just regarding what the estimated cost would be, not, if, not, if it, not our, what our legal authority is or not, but, but just what, um, what our expectation of cost would be if, if there were a situation um, that, that that would arise just looking ahead. Mr. Chairman or manager, that cost would be then to move to um, an alternate location of similar prominence, not to um, the list of areas that are prohibited within the general statute that's applicable without going into the law. I'm hearing Commissioner not only is not asking about that, um, if we are gonna limit it to a cost discussion, I'd just encourage you to be sure that your cost is allocated to an appropriate location as permitted by law. That, that'll be fine for the time being. Yeah. Then Mr. Chairman, we have um, Commissioner Ward and Commissioner Perkins Williams. Okay, Commissioner Perkins Williams. Um, uh, I almost forgot my question. Uh, my, my, uh, that, policy that we voted on Monday as it relates to mass, I thought we were trying it, Mr. Mr. I don't, for just from last week, last meeting to the next meeting with the, with, so that the employees will have an opportunity to discuss it with their super. Or wasn't it? Or am I remembering it wrong? I'm just trying to get clarification. The, as I understood the intent of the, the board's action on Monday, June the 1st was to direct me to write a, a policy to put into effect for county employees moving forward to wear face masks. Then you'd come back in two weeks to That's what I thought. A, a separate and second matter, that being <coughs> you want the, uh, I would consult the 10 municipalities over the next um, week and a half. I've already started that process. We'll have a call today at one o'clock with them. I've already informed them of the topic to see if they have any interest within the 10 municipalities to make this a countywide um, ask requirement, however you want to, want, to, want to word it. And then that would be brought back on the 15th. But the, the intent of the face mask for all employees would be from this point until right, the, the, right now, the way it's written through December 31st, unless you terminate it sooner or extend it. I thought it was just to the next meeting. I mean, I didn't think it was a long period of time. You were supposed to get some feedback. Or, or did I hear it wrong? Yeah, the, the, the feedback was, was whether in my discussion with the managers of the 10 municipalities, whether they would have interest in um, having a countywide um, policy per se on this. And I'd report back to you on Monday the 15th regarding that. And that when we will dis uh, talk about the face mask again, right? Right for okay. count for countywide all for within the jurisdiction of Pitt County and its ten municipalities. But the county employee Sorry. workforce sure. is from this point going forward to December thirty first, unless She's changed otherwise. Okay. I think She's my separate. municipality uh, discussed it last night. All right, thank you. What about our employees? Okay, uh, Commissioner Ward. Time to close. <laughs> Commissioner Ward. Okay, um, Mr. Chairman, um, I would kindly request that we uh, get back and focus on our budget. This is a budget workshop, and this is probably the most important work that we do right now as commissioners. And this is not going to be an easy budget for us to come to grips with. And I would like for us to uh, move forward with. Uh, directing our manager and um, our uh, um, Brian, I'm sorry, Brian, I can't think of your title right now, and our other uh, employees to take a look at the suggestions that were made. And if anyone has anything else to say about that, they need to uh, let that be known and let's move forward because we have another workshop in the morning with education and that. 
Thank you. Uh, Ms. Manager? Mr. Chairman, I would, I would recommend you re recess the meeting till eight o'clock in the morning, unless there's any other input. Very good. The meeting is so set for eight o'clock in the morning, and we'll see you then, and we'll talk to you at that time. Meeting is adjourned.